So in summary, we've got this black and white. We're, <coughs> we're so focused on pathology on the left-hand side. Fructose equals fatty liver. Fatty liver equals insulin resistance. Um, fatty liver equals VLDL and high trigs in the blood. High VLDL means l low LDL. High trigs means low HDL. High to its worst role, HDL ratio predicts small dense LDL. Small dense LDL predicts atherosclerosis. That's all the disease size. If you look on the health side, low carb means fat adaption. Fat adaption means that you make LDL because you're, you're focused on fat for energy, but you burn it quickly. So the VLDL is low because it never really stays in the blood long enough to have high triglycerides. And then a low LDL means that um, you've got all this traffic of LDL being converted to LDL. So all the empty trucks, because your body's using up all that fat for energy, the empty trucks are lining up in your blood to get back to the liver and load up again. And so the high LDL is just a measure of this lipid energy traffic. And then the low trigs mean, through CATP means you're not using up your HDL. Your HDL is a high normal level. And your low total cholesterol HDL ratio tells you that your LDL is in the large buoyant form. It's its normal transport form. And large buoyant LDL is the healthy form. Thank you, Ken. That was a great talk. I'm a bit of a fanboy, so I really do need to thank you personally for you've been a huge influence on my journey in low carb and lipids and so on and so forth. Um, I'll just be quick with hopefully a couple of questions. HDL, do you have any visibility about modification of HDL representing pathology similar to the way we see modified LDL? Uh, no, we don't have any glycated HDL measure, which would be of interest. Um, the, the lipid profile that we have does have, uh, you know, different zones for HDL, but to be honest, I've never looked at it. Um, I suspect it's just going to reflect what's happening to LDL, but I've never looked at it because it's never really been a question. But we do have some data sitting in the laboratory and I'd be happy to review it with you if you're interested. <laughs> I'd be delighted. Yeah. I, I guess the, uh, the point is I ob often observe elevated HDLs where any time they get over about 2.8, it does seem to be suboptimal in the same way that when I see triglycerides get 0.3 and maybe even 0.4, sometimes I see that representative of malabsorption and also possibly suboptimal. So yeah. I think the point is that I seem to be feeling that there's a, a centre point there where yeah. optimal levels are and the extremes are where the problem lay. Yeah, now, um, people have shown there's a J-curve for HDL, so very low levels harmful, very high levels also becoming harmful. They've been assigning most of that risk to genetics at the tie end. There are some people that genetically have high HDL, which means there's something different about their lipid transport and that may or may not be good. Now, I'll just one more comment because I just want to keep the mic away from Grant because he looks really, really <laughs> eager to speak. <laughs> so um, somebody asked me yesterday about glycation from fructose. We know that fructose has a glycation potential of seven to ten times greater than glucose. And the question was, how do we test it in pathology? And I was like, I don't know. I, the, I know that it might be reflected slightly in HbA1c, but it's certainly the dominant influence on HbA1c is glucose. Is there any tests we have for fructose glycation, especially considering, and I think this is just an important point, that people when they have diabetes and they have higher blood sugar levels, there's a pathway that converts glucose to fructose. It's called the polyol pathway, and that can convert up to about 30% of glucose to fructose. That's a great question, as I would expect. The um, fructose levels in the blood are like a thousand times lower than glucose levels. The body does not want high fructose levels in the blood. They're micromolar level. But they do attach, as you say, it does attach. And when we're measuring haemoglobin A1C, we're focused on the A1C measure, which is glucose stuck to haemoglobin. But haemoglobin A1A and A1B are other adducts. And I'm pretty sure haemoglobin A1B is the fructose 1,6-phosphate adduct of haemoglobin. So we can get a measure in those labs running electrophoresis uh, that 
capable of separating haemoglobin A1b, that would be a measure of, of um, persistent elevations of fructose. But, but yeah, it seems like the body does not want fructose in the circulation. And that's why it quickly converts it to fat in the liver and doesn't really let it out.